Hey guys, this um, <clears throat> next presentation is about um, brinksman brinkmanship and the really heightened sense of tension that existed in the in the Cold War period and how it manifested itself in some different ways. Believe it or not, you do not have a handout, I don't think, for this. Um, you're going to have to just, oh my gosh, take notes on a piece of paper. Shut my mouth, I'm getting so lazy. Um, but uh, I think that this is a really interesting time period in terms of um, just how... Uh, kind of the state of paranoia that existed in the 1950s and actually manifested itself in a lot of interesting um, kind of cultural things like um, monster movies and this kind of idea of an unstoppable threat that um, people are having to deal with. Um, a lot of that was uh, came out of this time period of um, Cold War conflict. So we're looking here at brinkmanship and, and um, Cold War foreign policy. We're going to try and figure out what MAD, uh, Mutually Assured Destruction and Brinkmanship, was and how it shaped and limited our armed forces and how it shaped and limited our foreign policy. All right. Mutually Assured Destruction had to do with the fact that the Soviets had developed a nuclear bomb ability just as we had. So by the mid-1950s, we have nuclear weapons, they have nuclear weapons. And so Mutually Assured Destruction just wants to uh, reassure everyone that if if they bomb us first, we can bomb them back, and uh, we'll all go down in a blaze of, of um, nuclear holocaust, okay? So the idea behind this is that, well, if, if you know that if you shoot them, if you shoot nuclear bombs at them, that surely they won't shoot them back at you, because that would be uh, an act of suicide. So this is supposed to deter any attack from actually taking place, and in some ways it's ironic. In some ways this was the most, you know, tension-filled time period um, in American history, but in another sense it was the most stable because of this sense that, well, who would actually carry out an, an attack if it was going to lead to your own destruction. Uh, this is also called massive retaliation. So massive retaliation, mad, mutually assured destruction, they're all kind of synonymous for the same idea. The result is what we call brinkmanship. Uh, this was a term uh, penned by John Foster Dulles, and it was the idea that, well, we're really willing to go to the very brink of atomic war um, and we always felt that we were on the brink of atomic war during this time period. It creates a lot of tension and hysteria. And um, it also results in a whole lot of reliance upon our Air Force. You know, suddenly the idea is that, well, any future conflicts are going to take place uh, through nuclear bombings. And all of that's about rockets and planes and, and those things. So we don't really need a conventional army. We don't really need a conventional navy anymore. Um, and instead, we'll just put all of our eggs in the uh, in the Air Force basket related to bombs. Um, you can see that things like this are the result of this sense that we are on the very brink of war all of the time. This is a bomb shelter that um, some uh, families who were able and had the resources to, to build did build. You can see here how they have bunks for sleeping and blankets and canned food. And this clearly was thought to be a place where one could go and live for a long period of time were there to be a nuclear kind of holocaust that... Um, made life on earth above ground untenable. Another way in which this time period um, was kind of, tensions were increased was through uh, the Middle East. Okay, so let's remember that by now we have gasoline engines and cars. Uh, ever since the 1920s, cars have become prevalent. And those make us very dependent upon oil and um, gas that is made from refined oil. And so the Middle East, this area here, has become of increased importance to um, us and the access that we have to um, oil reserves that have been discovered in that area. So this leads uh, President Eisenhower to issue something called the Eisenhower Doctrine. The way that this started is that uh, Egypt, uh, led by Abdel Nasser, they came to us and to Britain and France asking for a handout to help build a dam on the, As uh, the Aswan Dam on the Nile River. And we refused to give them the money. And so they went to the Soviet Union with their handout. The Soviet Union was all too happy to help them. And when we saw that the Soviets were trying to kind of get a foothold in the Middle East by giving aid to Egypt, that seemed like a, a threat to all the NATO countries that um, were um, kind of sitting on the sidelines. So Eisenhower, also known as Ike, um, he declared that we are going to protect the Middle East from the spread of communism and that that is a stated foreign policy goal of ours to maintain access to oil reserves in the Middle East um, and not let communism threaten that. So this is kind of like the open door notes in the sense that we we knew that China uh, and trade in China was going to be key to our economic prosperity so we issued the open door notes saying that we wouldn't let it get carved up. Well so here we know now that the Middle East is going to be of increasing importance to our country's um, 
self-interest, and so we're making sure that the Middle East doesn't get taken over um, by communism. Um, so it's all about us protecting our access to oil, and that's been a stated foreign policy objective from this time period forward. Okay. Another thing that happened during this time period that shows uh, the way in which brinkmanship is, is shaping our actions is in Hungary. You can see here that this red area here is um, where Hungary is located in Eastern Europe. It had been taken over by the Soviet Union after World War II. But in Hungary, there is um, a revolt of mainly young people who want to overthrow communism. And uh, while our, our stated foreign policy objective is, is containing communism, not rolling back communism, we certainly are supportive of these young people who want to overthrow communism in their own country. And we pledge to help them. But in the back of our minds, we're also afraid that if we do anything too direct to help them, that we could prompt the Soviets to um, uh, attack us and we could get in the crossfire and, and World War III would be started. So it's really quite tragic what happens in Hungary is um, the, uh, the students began their rebellion and uh, Soviet tanks rolled in to put down the rebellion and the students began communicating with the United States like, hey, are you going to come help us? You know, you said you would help us. And uh, the United States just basically said, you know, much as we would like to help you, we really can't take the risk of, of launching World War III, uh, that Hungary really isn't worth World War III to us. And so in the end, we really didn't, didn't come in and, and save the day. And as a result, 30,000 Hungarian students, um, we believe, were killed uh, in that revolt without any assistance uh, from the United States, even though we'd made verbal commitments in the past that we would help them. So... Um, what this shows is the limitations of, um, the, really the limitations of this policy that we, we don't really have any way to help them uh, other than um, World War III being started. So um, this Hungarian revolt uh, is going to help us think a little bit more through how um, this brinkmanship policy is, is kind of ties our hands at some level. The next thing that's important is uh, this. This looks really not that impressive. It looks kind of like a big metal pan with some rods coming out of it. And that is Sputnik, or Sputnik as we call it in the United States. Um, not really that impressive except to the degree that the Soviets are able to launch it into orbit and it orbits the United States at regular intervals. I mean it orbits the whole Earth at regular intervals. I think about every 22 minutes it circled the globe. And it was visible from the ground with the naked eye if you were really concentrating. Um, you know, this satellite was not taking pictures of the United States. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a direct threat. Instead, what it showed is that they could now launch something into orbit. And if they can launch a satellite into orbit, it means they could also launch a nuclear weapon. That they could literally, like, hit a button in the Soviet Union and launch a weapon without flying planes over us and putting themselves at risk. Um, that literally they could launch a nuclear attack via... Um, unmanned rockets. These would be called Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs. And this really struck fear in the hearts of Americans um, as they considered that the Soviets had really surpassed us in the space race. Um, so the question becomes, well, how did this happen? You know, How did we have the technological uh, advantage at the end of World War II where we had, uh, we had invented the atomic bomb? And in very short order, the Soviets were able to catch up with us and now have surpassed us, um, half through espionage, um, since they did spy on us during the uh, atomic bomb development. But now they, they clearly passed us. And so a lot of people in America started wondering, well, what's, what's happened? What's changed? And they came to blame you, students, high school students. The idea was that our schools were just not holding our students to rigorous standards, that we had um, not enough time on task. We had a lot of sock hops and social things happening at the high school level. Um, we were not teaching lab sciences or foreign language or upper order math classes like calculus. We're not being taught at the high school level. And um, so the whole idea was that we needed to rigorize the uh, high school and make it um, harder and more competitive and really uh, challenge our students to uh, and hold them to higher academic standards that would allow us to continue to prevail in all matters, scientific, mathematic, and, and space related. So, um, what we see after that is a total overhaul in U.S. education. They started foreign language classes and calculus and things that really required higher order thinking skills and applied science um, to their curriculum to try and launch um, a revolution in U.S. education that would allow us to be at the forefront of uh, technological developments in the future. So, 
you want to know why you have to take foreign language now in those hard math classes, you can blame Sputnik. Another thing that caused really amazing uh, tensions in this time period was something called the U-2 incident. Before U-2 was a band, it was a plane. They were spy planes that would fly miles up in the air and could uh, spy on the United uh, the USSR from uh, uh, the United States. One pilot um, named Gary Powers was shot down over the um, Soviet Union. And um, Dwight D. Eisenhower was actually meeting with the leader of the Soviet Union at the time period. His name was Nikita Khrushchev. And um, when Eisenhower heard that uh, one of our planes had been shot down over the Soviet Union, he played it real cool because he had knowledge that, um, well, there was no fear that they would know for sure that it was a spy plane because anyone in those planes had agreed that if they were shot down over enemy territory, they would take a needle um, out of the, the console and they would shoot it in their leg and commit suicide because no live pilot should be found as a result of the U-2 flight. Because what they would do is take that live pilot, torture him, and get a confession from him that could then the Soviets could then leverage against the United States. So when Dwight D. Eisenhower heard that our plane had been shot down, he he wasn't he didn't sweat it. He said, "Oh, um, he lied. He said uh, it's probably a weather plane. It was shot down over y'all. We're sorry, but you know, it, was, it was a lost weather plane." And uh, Nikita Khrushchev was like, "Really? Like over two thousand miles into Soviet territory, you had a weather plane? Like he was that far off course?" It was kind of an outlandish story. But then uh, Nikita Khrushchev said, well, no, actually, we, uh, your pilot is still alive. His name is Gary Powers, and um, he's singing like a canary, um, telling us everything about his mission. Um, so then there was a really interesting uh, debate broke out in America as to whether Gary Powers was a, an embarrassment to America or if the requirement that he commit suicide was just out of line. Um, so a lot of people weren't quite sure how to feel about Gary Powers and his, <coughs> excuse me, his failure to commit suicide. Um, as a part of this mission. Um, eventually, the meeting between Khrushchev and uh, Eisenhower breaks up. Uh, Eisenhower refuses to apologize. He knows the Soviets are spying on us as well. So, um, The U.S. refusal to apologize and uh, U.S.-Soviet relations reached kind of a high point um, in tension. Um, and so this is another kind of brick in the wall of uh, our devolving uh, relationship. This is what Gary Powers looked like. Um, this is the kind of needle that was supposed to be used to to commit suicide in the cockpit, and you can see that he died in 1977 um, and was a veteran of the Korean War uh, before this time period. So uh, He eventually did come back to the United States. We exchanged uh, him for a prisoner. Uh, there was a prisoner exchange between us and the Soviets that brought him back to the United States. All right, the final thing you need to know about this time period is um, we decided that this whole brinkmanship policy was really kind of tying our hands because we, we couldn't achieve our foreign policy objectives around the world without starting World War III. It was like we could bomb or do nothing. And um, so we decided that there was another way to achieve our foreign policy objectives besides bombing or doing nothing, and that would be to establish uh, secret missions around the world called the CIA, and uh, that would be the Central Intelligence Agency. And what the CIA would allow us to do is to overcome this problem of massive retaliation since every problem isn't worth starting World War III over, for example, we didn't want to start World War III over Hungary and the Hungarian crisis, what we can do instead is do secret operations around the world and uh, achieve our foreign policy objectives um, without doing it in an open way that could lead to World War III. So the CIA is going to do secret operations around the world and protect U.S. interests at the same time. So this will be done kind of below the radar and the Soviets won't even be aware of it, but it will still be trying to help us meet the objectives of the Cold War. The problem with the CIA is that a lot of times we have to pick between supporting a corrupt dictatorship that's not communist um, in order to fight communism. And so uh, we kind of get a bad name uh, in some areas of the world during this time period because we're so busy fighting communism that we don't always stick up for um, the good guys. Um, let me give you an example. And since we're talking about spies, I thought I would don my hat and glasses just one more time. So an example where spies come in handy. Let's say that um, in Iran, the uh, leader of Iran is wanting to take over the oil industry, wants to nationalize the oil industry. That's exactly what was happening. He was, uh, he was actually elected leader, though, of Iran. But this whole nationalization thing seems like it's a takeover um, and a movement towards communism. Uh, they're taking over private businesses. So um, what we do is we overthrow, we support, um, the CIA goes in and trains some rebels 
to support the overthrow of the elected leader, the Prime Minister of Iran. And instead, we bring back the king. Uh, we put a king back in power in Iran. His name is the Shah. Uh, Shah is another word for king. So that's just an example of where um, the CIA helps support the overthrow of an elected leader um, because we were afraid he was communistic. Another example would be in Guatemala. Um, the leader of Guatemala was also nationalizing um, and taking land from private investors and redistributing it to the poor. And so we helped train and support uh, a militia that overthrew the leader of uh, Guatemala. So these are just a few ways in which the CIA uh, worked to fight communism around the world and uh, meet our foreign policy objectives, but wasn't always done above board, and it wasn't always done um, in an effort to uh, expand democracy. Um, so if we had to pick between democracy and, and capitalism during this time period, uh, we, we seem to pick defending capitalism, even if it led to democracy kind of falling by the wayside. So an unfortunate but um, true circumstance related to the CIA's actions in the time period. Okay. A little long-winded that time. Sorry. See you in class.